Hi, everybody. It's seven o'clock on um, Thursday, March 18th, and we are here tonight. Um, the Conklin House is hosting a, uh, a historical talk together with the Babylon Village Historical Society and our uh, town historian, Mary Cascone. Uh, this is part of our historical and educational program over at the Conklin House, and we're happy tonight to welcome uh, town historian Mary Cascone as our speaker. Um, Mary has been the town historian for how many years now, Mary? Seven. Seven. Seven yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Yeah. She recently joined the board of the Babylon Village Historical Society. Um, there's a lot of history here in Babylon Village, and uh, we look forward to working together with the Babylon Village Historical Society to, to bring that history to our residents. It's, a, it's important for us to know where we are so we know where we're going, or where we have been so we know where we're going. Um, so tonight, um, I would like to say welcome to Mayor Mary Adams, and congratulations, Mary Adams, to your victory earlier this week. Um, and for making history yourself as uh, Babylon Village's first female mayor since the incorporation in 1893. So round of applause for Mayor Mary Adams. Glad you were able to join us. Uh, and the, uh, who says Robin Calvin. Um, the, uh, the webinar, the format tonight is a webinar. So there is a Q&A button down at the bottom. If you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask during this presentation, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section. And so with that, I'm going to share my, my uh, screen with you so that you can share your screen, Mary, and we can get on with our presentation. Okay, I have to choose the right one. Do you see our historical institutions? You see it. Okay, then I chose the right one, yippee. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always happy to reach people via Zoom. It's a weird situation not to be able to see people, but um, I welcome this. So uh, our first slide here tonight, we like to remind people of all the historic institutions in the village of Babylon. Of course, uh, Robin Silvestri is representing uh, the Nathaniel Conklin House. And as she mentioned, we also have our village historical society, which is represented by the, the, old, the old library postcard at the bottom left. And then the building that I occupy as the town of Babylon historian, that includes the village of Babylon, um, is the old town hall there with that cool little car and the folks standing on the steps. So tonight we will be talking about Argyle Park. If you were able to join us last month, um, I talked about the Cuban giants. And I realized that when we talk about the Cuban giants, it's so tied in with the Argyle Hotel, it's tied in with the park, um, that we really needed to talk about the park. Um, there's so much to tell about it. And there's in fact so much to tell that it really needs to be divided into two parts. So um, I hope you enjoyed this one and we'll be able to enjoy this next month, but I really love the fact that this is being recorded. Um, I heard from so many people who weren't able to make last month's uh, presentation, but they were able to watch it later on on YouTube. So when you think about Argyle Park, I think that the, the thing that sets it apart, it's the water, okay? So that's why we have to start by talking about the Carl's River. Um, the water that we, that flows over the waterfall there, you know, right on the north side of, of Main Street, comes a long distance. In fact, it starts um, north of Deer Park, probably in the Dix Hills area, in underground streams that flow into Geiger Lake. That water then flows down into Belmont Lake, which flows down into Southard's Pond, before it meanders its way to Argyle Lake, goes over the waterfall, waterfall under Main Street and down the Carl River into the Great South Bay. The, you'll, you'll see it spelled all different kinds of ways. There's Carl's River with the apostrophe. Um, it is named for the Carl family. I've heard that um, it's most likely named for Captain Timothy Carl, uh, a captain in the American Revolution. Um, little side note, great grandfather of Albert Carl from where we get Carl Avenue. That's a whole nother story. So another Carl that comes into play here is Major Timothy Carl, a cousin to Captain Timothy. 
Um, many of you might know his house, you just don't know that you do. He completed his Main Street home, which we know as the 1801 house. That's pictured there, probably in the 1920s. Um, today, that house is what you see behind the left side of the Argyle Square sign. Um, it's tucked back there, you know, kind of by the little duck pond over by the playground at the park. But that house used to face Main Street. And that was Major Timothy Carl's home. Um, around 1810, he started a, a mill for woolen goods, okay, processing the wool to, to for fabrics, sweaters, blankets. And that was where the, the Argyle Falls are now. Okay, that you needed the water, uh, the water power, great site for it. After his death, the mill was operated by several other people. Okay, it's kind of muddy, but by 1850, Isaac Willits um, buys that mill. Okay, this is not the paper mill picture. We don't have a picture of the paper mill, but this is an example of a mill building with you know a water overflow that helps um, operate the machinery to whether you're, you have a paper mill, a sawmill, or a grist mill. Mr. Willits had been a Queens County Sheriff in 1846. And I do wanna remind you that when we think about Queens County at the time, that would have included what's now Nassau County. Um, up until 1899, what's now Nassau County was part of Queens County. So it's not that he came from, you know, as far away as Queens County is today, but really just a few miles away from his jurisdiction. So the, the paper mill, um, many of us might've done this uh, with our kids or maybe you know when we were younger, it's a kind of a camp project. You know, Sometimes they have you uh, rip up rags or, or take other pieces of paper um, to make new paper, but they made their paper out of straw, okay? And where did they get the straw? From the local farmers. So these are examples of the newspaper articles that would be printed announcing to farmers, hey, we want 100 tons of straw. Bring it to us, bring it to the paper manufactory, um, and, and we'll pay you this much for it. Um, you can see 1852, 1870, uh, they wanted rye straw, they wanted clean straw, uh, wanted immediately, and, and here were the prices. There, I have seen, I didn't put some here, but there are other ones where they say, you know, we have enough straw for the, for the season, you know, let us catch up for a little while. But this is one of the reasons why you'd want to get the local paper to, to look and see if, if straw was something you could bring to the mill. In addition to Mr. Willits, um, his son, Martin, Sherman Tweedy of the, Sher of, the of the Sherman House Hotel, and a few others were also mill operators in those years. Here is the paper mill on the map in 1858. Um, the main, you can see road to Deer Park Station. That's what we know as Deer Park Avenue. And South Country Road going left to right. That's what we know as West Main Street to East Main Street. But there's the paper mill. It's right there on the east side of the river. And Mr. Willits. Like I said, in 1850, he comes to Babylon. Um, he gets he gets started with the mill, and within 20 years, he's really done well for himself. He's in, invested in a few different businesses, and 1871 seems to have been something of a banner year for him. Um, this is the Willits Building. If you don't understand what the view of this picture is, just imagine that you are sitting, waiting at the light. Um, you're on Deer Park Avenue facing Main Street, and that burger bar is at the corner to your front right. Um, looking across the yellow building is now Plessers, not the same building, but the same location. And the Willits building that's pointed there is now the Norton and Siegel building. And it confused me for a very long time because I'm looking at a three-story brick building, and I know that Norton and Siegel is now a one-story building. Um, there was a fire, at least according to Aaron Stein. Um, there was a fire and instead of taking down the whole building or uh, replacing the upper floors that were damaged, they just left it as a one story building. But um, what remains would actually be known as 
the Willits building. In 1871, again, the same year that he opened that building, he donated the 800 pound bell for the Presbyterian church. Yes, that's the same Presbyterian church that is just a couple doors down from, uh, from Glenn's dinette. I don't know that it's the same bell though. I'm gonna let Judy Skillen from the, from the church acknowledge that sometime. Also in 1871, as you can see from this ad, um, along with his son, Martin, Isaac Willits was a proprietor of the American House Hotel. Now, many of you may not have heard of the American House. It, it burned down in um, the 1880s. And so it's, it hasn't been in the local lexicon as much, but it was around the same age as the LaGrange. You can see it almost reminds you a little bit of the style with its three stories and everything. And this, it had a very popular saloon um, or bar. And in fact, that bar is the one that Mrs. Conklin lived across. So if you know your Babylon origin story, um, the naming that Nathaniel Conklin comes down from, from uh, the Half Hollow Hills area, and he brings his mother Phoebe, and that she complains that this place is like another Babylon because she's living across from this raucous hotel. It is the saloon here in the American house that she was complaining about. Um, it went through several owners. Um, what would happen is that there'd be an owner of the property and then there'd be somebody who ran it. So I don't believe that the Willits ever owned the American house, but you can see that they ran it, um, inviting summer visitors for the fishing, shooting and bathing in the immediate vicinity of the hotel. So um, after Mr. Willits, came the, the next owner of the mill property um, is this guy with an interesting name, Electus Bacchus Litchfield. He was the son of Congressman uh, Elijah Lit Litchfield, in fact, one of his five sons. He made his money by investing in railroad companies. He married Hannah Breed and he invested in Babylon real estate. So anyone who have see has seen this 1893 map, um, I get, I've, I've had lots of questions, people going, what is this Blythe thing? And it's, it's Blythebourne. They named their estate Blythebourne or Scottish for happy home. There on the left side of the lake, you can see each E.B. Litchfield residence. Um, something that I recently discovered is that Mr. Litchfield did not own the property. His wife did. A, uh, a fairly common occurrence that uh, the wife would own the country home, or it was a way of giving her some financial security. It might have also been a way of protecting money against business losses. Um, but very often it's the, the husbands that are credited with the owning, even if the wives were the ones that were the, the, the record owner on paper. Um, of course, their Blythebourne estate, which is all of the Argyle Park residential community, um, and the lake they named Blythebourne Lake. Apparently the paper mill was still there, but of course this is your country house. You don't want some kind of clanging machinery going on. So they seem to keep the, the business um, very quiet or they didn't run it full operation. They were generous to the community. In 1874, they donated a $1,000 organ for the Baptist Church, which I think you can all see my cursor. It, today, where is the Baptist Church, you ask? It is now the parking lot um, over by the Municipal Hall. Sorry. All right. It's over here by the, the Municipal Building. It's the little parking lot with the white picket fence next to the Historical Society. That's where the original Baptist Church was located. and. Each 4th of July, the, um, the Litchfields would have a great big fireworks display, which of course could be seen by people all around the village. And, um, and that was noted in the newspaper each year. And quite generously, Mr. Litchfield would instruct um, some of the, the keepers on his estate in the winter time to cut ice from his pond so that it could be used by people in the village come the, the summer months. That's how we used to get ice. 
Okay, so the other thing that Mr. Litchfield is known for is that you can see now on the north side of the railroad, okay, north of the, the lake, we can see south side railroad going across there. And it says E.B. Litchfield. And if you look closely enough, you can see the streets Litchfield Avenue and Livingston Avenue. Well, Mr. Litchfield, and it does seem to be Mr. Litchfield this time rather than his wife, he bought up this property and he started dividing it for housing lots. Of course, he did choose to name Litchfield Avenue after his own family. And he chose the name Livingston Avenue after his good friend, Henry Livingston, who published the Southside Signal newspaper. Yes, the same newspaper that this ad to buy his building sites was published in. He did make a lot of money. He made a lot of money in, in real estate. He made money by investing in railroads, but he also lost a lot of money. Um, he apparently lost money in the panics or the crashes of 1857 and 1873. It's that 1873 that kind of changes things for Babylon. So obviously in 1873, he loses money. He decides to sell that, um, that lakeside estate and he sells it to a man named Charles Fox. Mr. Fox was president of the Southside Railroad. Now, if you've never heard of the Southside Railroad, it's, it's what the Babylon line is today. That first came to Babylon in 1867, and the Southside Railroad operated on its own as an independent railroad company until it was bought out by the Long Island Railroad um, later on in the mid-1870s. Um, so Mr. Fox buys it in April of 1873. By that summer, it's sold to, to Stephen B. Thayer. Um, who is only, the only description I could find of Mr. Thayer is that he was a New York City capitalist. And um, I had to look this up because I had to, to find the right way to describe um, being a capitalist. And that's a wealthy person who uses money to invest in trade and industry for profit in accordance with the principles of capitalism. So my description is it's someone who has enough money to invest in things to make them more money. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good for their bank account. Um, apparently not all of Mr. Litchfield's investments worked out, but Mr. Thayer seems to have, have done well for himself. And in 1874, Mr. Litchfield did declare bankruptcy. The Blytheborn name, however, did carry on, as we'll see in a little bit. So that's what brings us Austin Corbin. And again, it's, it's all about the railroad. Um, the influence of the railroad on Babylon cannot, it cannot be stated enough. Um, here's our, our dear Mr. Corbin. He was president of the Long Island Railroad. He invested in banks and railways. He was one of the developers of Coney Island and he had a North Babylon estate that was named Forest Farm, kind of up Deer Park Avenue, maybe on the east side of Deer Park Avenue, maybe around where the North Babylon High School is now. And this was his project, the Argyle Hotel. Um, many people have heard me say it before, the, the biggest, the um, most expensive, the most luxurious hotel in Babylon and the least successful, but they didn't know that when they started. Um, where does the name Argyle come from? Well, when the announcement was made, um, starting around 1880, there were rumors that, that maybe there was going to be this new hotel project for Babylon. And in 1881, it was reported that Mr. Corbin and the Long Island Improvement Company would commence a hotel project with capital of $5 million, a large share of which was furnished by English stockholders. And one of them was the Duke of Argyle, the Scottish Duke of Argyle. Um, and, and that is the legend of how it was named. Um, the Duke of Argyle had invested in a lot of his other projects. I don't know if Coney Island was one of them, but in projects like that. And so as, an, as a nod to him, 
perhaps to thank the Duke for, you know, all of the investment money that made Mr. Corbin a very wealthy man. He named the hotel after him, although it is definitely spelled differently. We use an American, Americanized version of the name. So this is the Argyle Hotel. Opened in June of 1882, the majority of the work was um, done by 85 workmen in just three months. I love this picture. Um, the re reflection in, the, in, in Argyle Lake just, just can't be compared. So this is an advertise, uh, the next couple of pages are advertising booklet from um, the collections of the Village of Babylon Historical Society. And this is from the second season, it's from 1883. But this is the type of thing that if you were to write to the hotel, you know, remember those days before the internet, when you had to write away for a brochure um, because you were looking for a vacation spot. That's exactly what this is. You would receive in the mail um, this, this nice sketch on the cover um, and this description of the hotel being on 70 acres that of course it had the spring water lake, um, it had all the comforts of the best city hotels and just being one and one quarter hours from Madison Square or Wall Street taking the Long Island Railroad. Um, there were 12 cottages. You could either stay at a room in the hotel and they had, they had plenty of them, or you could rent an entire cottage. If you rented an entire cottage, you could either you know, choose to bring your cook with you, perhaps you could hire a cook, or you could take all your meals at the hotel. And we'll see where those cottages were located. But this, the, the second to last paragraph is really what all of the hotels in Babylon were about, kind of this statement. The air of Babylon is renowned for its coolness and purity and for its benefit to those suffering from malaria and hay fever. The Great South Bay is but 10 minutes distance from the Argyle and every facility for boating and fishing is afforded. The drives in every direction are varied and beautiful. And that's why people came here. Many times, um, well, today we talk about the Hamptons. You know, people from the city want to get to the Hamptons that, you know, not only is it the um, the popular place to be to be seen, but it was it, that was where the beaches were. OK, we were the ba we were the Hamptons of the time. The idea that we were just a little over an hour by railroad. Um, it was so easy to get here. And once you got here, you were away from the polluted air of New York City. The fact that we were right on the bay. Is, is what really sold us as a resort spot. So this is a map of the first floor of the Argyle. And I'm gonna to read to you um, the description. We don't, I do not know of any interior pictures of the Argyle. I, I believe that they're out there somewhere. Um, we just need to find them. And you know maybe people don't realize what it is, but this is, description of what the Argyle was from the, the newspaper article in the Southside Signal right before it opened. They, they wrote, on entering, the visitor is ushered into the grand hall on the lower floor, which is lighted and ventilated by large oval openings through the four floors, properly protected by strong ornamental railings. Here the offices are located and facing the main entrance is the grand staircase, finished and railed in solid woods ash predominating. To the left is the dining hall, which is to be one of the most prominent features of the house. It is 98 feet long by 47 feet wide and will seat with four private dining rooms adjoining, 600 persons at once. The interior is Gothic in natural woods lighted by large stained glass windows. The ceiling in the highest parts is 55 feet above the floor. The balance of the first floor is due to devoted to suites, private parlors, and sleeping apartments. There being about 300 of these, all connected with the office by patent electric bells. So a little bit of that um, reminds me of Downton Abbey, the idea of, you know, electric bells to summon someone to your room. Um, the next pages here show you the, the suites, um, the, guest, the guest rooms. 
So again, they write, on the second floor of the main parlors are located the balance being devoted to sleeping accommodations. The third floor is nearly a duplicate of the second. Three square tower-like structures surmount the main roof by two stories. The center of the building is surmounted by two ornamental towers, five and six stories high, with flagstaff 40 feet still higher. A view from the top of the towers is grand beyond description, affording a bird's eye view of a vast expanse of sea and shore. In addition to these, there are several upper piazzas and 24 private balconies. They're certainly selling um, the, the size and grandeur of this hotel. So let's look for a moment. This is um, the 1888 map of Babylon, and it gives you an idea of, of the hotel in relation to the lake and all of the cottages. Again, you can see that though the spelling is a little bit off, they're still calling it Blytheborn Lake. And the hotel has been open for six years at this point. So there's the, the hotel right up here, um, kind of in an L shape. And there are 11, 13, 13 cottages here on the grounds. Anyone who's ever driven through the Ar Ar Argyle Park residential section, these walkways, these paths sort of mimic the roads that are in there today, Montrose and Douglas and everything. You can see far at the left, there's a water tower, there's an engine hose company, that's their own fire brigade. There's the laundry, um, of course, far away from the guests, you know, heaven forbid that they, they see that work actually has to be done. And I must admit, from the moment I started to learn about the Argyle Hotel, I couldn't understand why this luxurious place was so close to the railroad. Um, I mean, you look at it, look, you see the Y in Argyle um, right above the hotel, and then just right above it is the Long Island Railroad. The idea of steam engines um, approaching the stations and rumbling and all the noise and the steam and everything that's going on. And then you realize that it was built by the president of the railroad. You know, <laughs> that's what brought people to, to Babylon. And I guess he, if, um, if he was going to have a hotel, you needed to see it from the railroad. Um, you know, it was going to be the first thing you saw as you entered the village. And, and from that point, he succeeded. Um, so why, why Babylon? We talked about the, the being close to the ocean. So I kind of wanted to explain here. Um, imagine that you have come to stay at the Argyle. Maybe you're not very familiar with, with the area, but the red star is the hotel and the yellow star is the location of the railroad station, um, as depicted in this postcard image. So I'm sure that there's a carriage if you're, you know, you could walk over to the railroad station if that's, if you so chose. And from there, you could catch a trolley car, okay? You could, you could buy a ticket and, and get onto this trolley, technically a horse car. Um, and there were rails in the street that followed that yellow line, okay? Okay, and essentially it's getting from the railroad station down Deer Park Avenue, crossing over Main Street and continuing down Fire Island Avenue. Anyone who has ever gone south on Fire Island Avenue and gotten to the light at Reed and the Crescent and wondered why in the world do I take a left and then take a right to continue on Fire Island Avenue, it's because the trolley route originally went around Judge Reed's property because the crescent just didn't exist at the time. Um, and, and the dotted line in the road shows us that that was the route of the trolley or the horse car. So you've made your way from the hotel, you went to the railroad, you got on one of these horse cars and you're slowly making your way down to the ferry docks or what we just call the village docks. So here, here are carriages that have arrived. Um, Admittedly, these pictures are more of 1905 rather than the 1880s when, um, when the hotel got started. But since we don't have those pictures, this is the next best thing. So there, your, the blue star down at the bottom of the screen shows you the village docks. And you get on one of those ferry boats. You arrive 
um, at the barrier beaches. And again, there is, there's an ocean scene um, in modest bathing dress uh, to enjoy the seaside. And that was one of the advantages of coming to the Argyle was access to the ocean. So going back to the hotel, um, these are some of the advertisements that appeared in New York City newspapers. Um, of course, they didn't need to advertise in the local newspapers because they weren't trying to attract the local community. They wanted to get New York City residents out here. So you can see um, in 1884, they're talking about, you know, rent one of the Argyle cottages, um, handsomely furnished, you know, all these amenities, um, meals served from the Argyle Hotel if desired. Then a few years later in 1890, the advertisements include Argyle Hotel, cottages, and casino. And we'll see that in, in one of the next maps that became part of the entertainment. The advertisement on the right with, with this kind of sketch of the hotel across the lake appeared in one of the Long Island Railroad brochures. Um, the Long Island Railroad was influential in advertising Long Island as a vacation destination and then later on as a place for residential housing. We saw it in the 1920s during that housing boom and we, we saw some influence of that after World War II as well. Because if they could set, if people would buy homes on Long Island but they still needed to commute to New York City for work, then that was a great way to get more commuters for the railroad. So this is the 1902 map, just confirming that. Yes, this is the 1902 map. And you can see there just south of the hotel is the casino. Um, some of the streets are named in there, like I mentioned before. And by 1902, we can see that some of the, the cottages that had all been rentals were now being purchased by people. Um, by 1902, it was labeled Argyle Lake. Um, and what, when I talk about how the hotel was the least successful, it stood for only 22 years. In 1904, the, um, the hotel was dismantled. It, bulldozers did not come at it. Um, it's more like carpenters came and carefully took it apart. Um, of course, there are more houses in the Argyle Park section today than were part of the hotel. A few of the original hotel cottages still stand. I think, I think it's two or three remain of those 13. Um, but many of the houses that were built after 1904 um, supposedly have fireplaces that, that have tiles from the hotel, um, windows. I wouldn't be surprised if there were banisters and things like that. I, I do like to, if, if you spend enough time staring at this picture that's up at the screen, it's, um, it's what I like to describe to people as early Photoshop, how you can't trust a photo. Um, the, at least two of those three boats and, and I think all three of them there in the foreground were not in that picture. Um, somebody drew them in. We find this a lot on postcards and, and advertising pictures. Um, you can't always trust a photo. So that's the Argyle Hotel. Um, next month, I will talk more about what happened after the hotel closed. Um, we will talk about defunct hotel to Village Green. We'll talk about how it went from the, the hotel to what we know now as the, the Village Park. And, and you will have to join us next month to find out what in the world baking powder has to do with Argyle Park. But I do promise that I will, that I will share what I know about baking powder and Argyle Park. Great teaser, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I came up with that last minute. <laughs> wow, I can't wait for April 22nd. <laughs> but as always, Mary, it's, a, it's fascinating to learn the history of our little village. You know, it's so easy to think that it always looked the way it does now, but there's so much um, 
background stories that go uh, and characters that um, define what we are as a village. I love learning about the names of the streets. I recently learned that all the, um, and maybe you can confirm it, all the, the kids' names, the street names, Ellen and James and George, they were all uh, Cooper kids. I know that George, James, and Simon were all Coopers, but that's mm -hmm. interesting. Now I got to check Ellen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you I'll will? check on that one. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, and uh, before we even start with the questions, I want to say thank you so much for putting together this fantastic presentation. Oh, um, you're so welcome. It's a really weird thing to just talk and not see anybody or hear anybody. I just uh, figured I'll just keep going. So, <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's hear from the people. <laughs> All right. So, um, Rita B. Rose, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to um, to unmute yourself and ask your question. I can ask it for you in the meantime. Um, yes. Yes. Hey, Rita. Hi. That was fantastic. Uh, I I was one. I, I was wondering: Are there any historical plaques for the paper mill, the Baptist Church, and and will there be any plaque in Argyle for poet Oscar Wilde, who actually lectured there and, and at the Argyle Hotel? I never heard that. I want to. I'm going to look that up. That's great. Oscar Wilde at the Argyle. Yes, I have to see. I think I read it. I, I own the complete works of, of Oscar Wilde, and I'll have to try to find where he speaks about that or where I read that. But they said that uh, he stayed there uh, and uh, he he was on his New York uh, tour, you know, and uh, that's where he stayed. And uh, I guess when you showed us the first floor, they said he was in some kind of grand room. It must have been the dining room, maybe? I don't know where they would have hung. Okay, that's that's great. Um, no, there is there is not a, a plaque for the uh, paper mill, um, nor is there one for the Baptist church. Um, but I got to tell you, if we put a, a historic marker up for every one of them, you wouldn't be able to see anything for all the blue and yellow. <laughs> um, on on every street, but I think that that's that's what a lot of um, Conklin House and the Historical Society and the library are trying to do through these programs and some walking tours um, to let people know to know more about them. Yeah, but yeah. thanks for that Oscar Wilde uh, tip. You're welcome. So, and Mary, you may have answered this question already, but Ellen asked, um, where was the American House Hotel located? Northwest corner of Main Street and Deer Park Avenue where Burger Bar is now. Kind of stretched from the corner. It, it probably took up that whole block because um, it was set back from the road a little bit, at least according to the maps. So think about Burger Bar and go north a little bit. Um, there's a nail salon, there was a karate studio and then think all the way over to Chase Bank, kind of that whole block and it was something that was added on to you it starts in like the 17 around 1780 and then add another kitchen then add another wing um so from from the top it, on the maps it kind of looked like an f mm -hmm. because of all the wings that were spread out but yeah that northwest corner so steve loudon asked and i think um the maps probably answered this question what is the footprint of the hotel he knows the general location and i think we saw it on the maps but um steve lives in cottage number eight. Yes. Yes. I wasn't, I, I knew that you were in, in one of the cottages. I wasn't quite sure of the number. And I believe we, uh, the historical society got to use one of your photos in the Babylon village book. So I'll yes, publicly yes, thank you. Um, I don't know that we've ever met in person, but I, sh I know your name at least. I'm very familiar. <laughs> we'll the, make that happen. We'll make that yes, happen. Yes, please. Let's do. Um, Okay, Argyle Hotel. I brought this. Are, are they still looking at my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I brought that the 1902 back up. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, to work on an overlay of this map to like a current street map. That oh. might be kind of interesting. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, the shores of the of the lake have have been amended a little bit. I mean, of course, we've all seen the the great work that the village has been doing around the north part of the of the shoreline. But yeah, it changes shape from map to map. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, that would be a real interesting thing. Um, and we'll, we'll look into that. Good idea. That, has, that had indoor plumbing, right? Yes. In fact, I didn't read all of it. If you, if you go, um, if you go to my, the town historians blog, um, which I'll have uh, Robin put into the chat. I, ha I did reprint the entire article from when they opened the hotel. So you can read all of it because it did include how they had a water tower um, that was a distance away from the hotel, you know, so that you don't see the water tower. Um, but they talked about the good um, water flow that they had and they highlighted all of the fire extinguishers and everything else that they had. Because remember, this was a wooden hotel Mm -hmm. And that, that definitely would have been a concern about trying to get from the fourth floor in case of emergency. I have, a, I have one of the fire hydrants on the corner of my property that's original from the hotel. No. Oh, I got to see this. All right, you, you and I have got to get together. <laughs> All right. All right. Sounds good to me. 22 Argyle. 22 Argyle, Mary. Does 22. The, Mary, if, when we're looking at this map, where would the Litchfield house have been located? Um, kind of... Almost uh, based on the other maps, more like the area of the casino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, um, there were a few buildings that were on that property. We have a picture from 1937 of something that's called the Litchfield House. And I got to tell you, it does not look like a wealthy person's country estate. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to remember that things were a little bit more modest um, back then because you... This was the kind of like their rustic log cabin coming here to to hunt and shoot and fish. But yeah, I think it was around in the casino area. I love that they moved the houses around and the 1801 house. Um, if they must, would they have moved that with oxen? No, no, that the, was moved in the 50s. It was moved in the 50s. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, there are there are some real amazing stories of moving houses um like right down main uh right down deer park avenue in fact one of the last ones that happened was around 1912 1917 mm -hmm. and it caused such a problem because now there were more electric wires right. and it like wiped out the village i mean just imagine if like somebody moved was moving something and they wiped out everybody's internet just that kind of fervor <laughs> That's happening, and there was a street sitting in the middle of the a house sitting in the middle of the street for like days um, until they moved it, and people were declaring, "That's the last time we're going to move a house in the village." Wait, I do know that they moved the Conklin House that way in 1871. Oh yes, yes, uh, much much earlier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There wouldn't have been many as many things to run into at that time. <laughs> um, so. Ellen asked, were the street names in Argyle? Ellen, you can completely unmute yourself and ask your, anybody who'd like to can uh, unmute themselves and ask questions at this point. Um, she asked though, are the street names in Argyle Park named after people from the hotel? Thank you, Robin. You're welcome, Ellen. I am not sure. That's a great question. I'm, I'm more familiar with Cameron um, because there was someone by the last name of Cameron who inherited the Edwin Hawley estate. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Holly's Pond. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to put that down for, for the Historical Society and see if, I know that we, we work on lots of projects to try and figure out street names, mm -hmm. but that's one I haven't come across before. We've, we've heard so many of the street names that we've known like around the village tonight mentioned, right? Well, yeah. I live on George, so I can confirm that one. Yes. George, the son of Cooper. Yep. Okay. So Robin Calvin, um, she said that Oscar, Oscar, I'm not sure if that was the Oscars or Oscar uh, was at the hotel August 2nd, 1882. So Robin, who was Oscar? Uh, Oscar Wilde. Oh, Oscar Wilde, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. I am going to pull up that. Um, I'm going to pull up that newspaper clipping. That's fantastic. Yeah, look for August 2nd, 1882. <laughs> The very first season. <laughs> That's pretty specific. Robin, how did you find that? <laughs> it looks like um, on the on the uh, west side of the lake or the east side of the lake, the Carl estate was pretty large too. Yeah. Well, yes, you own all that property. You get to name the street after yourself. <laughs> I mean, I live on Fire Island Avenue and my property was owned by Mr. Carl. 
anyone who lives on Thompson, um, South Carl, most of North Carl, um, and the west side of Fire Island Avenue, north of Reed, you're all sitting on Carl property. Cool. All right, so does anybody have any final questions for Mary for this evening? Again, I wanna remind everybody, um, what is it, April 17th? No, April 22nd. April 22nd at 7 p.m. Uh, the registration, the event ride is already up. If you'd like to register for it, just search, um, just search Conklin House in um, Eventbrite to find the Argyle Park Part Two, from defunct hotel to Village Green. I'm um, I'm excited to hear it, Mary. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight and all of your knowledge. And I want to oh, say thank welcome. you too. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Have a good night.